these. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Tremont Columbus Bus Lanes Phase 2 project. My name is Reagan Cecchio, and I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's meeting. Next slide. I would like to note that all MBTA activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements preventing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, limited English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. If you have any questions or concerns, please visit mbta.com forward slash title six, that's title VI, to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. I would also like to remind everyone of the rules for participating in this meeting, as well as remind everyone that the meeting is being recorded. While we do wish we were able to do this meeting in person, we are hoping that we have designed an online public meeting that will be interactive and provide an opportunity for us to have a conversation together. Before we can begin that conversation, I do want to review a few technical aspects of the Zoom platform. Next slide. We have ASL interpreters tonight for the meeting. If you would like to view the ASL interpreter at all times, keep your view settings to get in gallery mode. To pin the interpreter's video, click the ellipses in the top right corner of the interpreter's video and select pin video. You will need to repeat this process each time we switch interpreters. We also have interpreters tonight who are translating the meeting into Spanish, Haitian Creole and Mandarin. If you require these services, please click the interpretation button on your screen, it's the globe icon, which, and select which language you wish to hear. In addition, we will be holding small group discussions later in the meeting. If you would like to be in the Spanish language, Haitian Creole or Mandarin language small group discussion, please message a project team member in the chat so we can move you into the appropriate discussion section at that time. At this moment, I will ask all English speakers to please select English as their chosen language. This will allow you to hear translated non-English comments during Q&A. Next slide. You can view closed captions by clicking the closed captions feature and selecting from the options shown. Show subtitle will display a caption at the bottom of the screen. View full transcript will display the meeting's audio transcription in a window to the right. Next slide. All attendees have been muted during the presentation to prevent excessive background noise. If you are viewing this meeting on a computer, you can toggle to speaker view to see the presentation more prominently. If you are on a smartphone, you can swipe to change the views. You can also use the chat button to submit a typed question or comment at any point during the meeting. The chat is not open, but if you direct your question to ask a question, we will receive the comment and question. We will also be monitoring the chat during the presentation, but ask that you hold your substantive comments and questions for the question and answer session that will be held later in the meeting. If you have a technical problem, please share your issue in the chat feature at any point in the meeting and we will respond as quickly as possible. I'll note that all project team members are listed with either their agency name or project team next to their names in the participant list. When you submit a question or comment, they will not be visible to all the attendees when submitted. And we will try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion of the meeting. During the small group discussions though, the chat will be visible to everyone 
and we encourage you to keep any comments in the chat respectful to other attendees. If you use inappropriate language, you will be removed from the meeting. And now, after all of that, I would like to uh, introduce Philip Cherry from the MBTA team, who will begin the main presentation. Philip? Thanks so much, Reagan. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining. We're excited to uh, be able to talk a little bit about this project and just as importantly, to get your feedback. Uh, first, some introductions. Uh, to be brief, I'm just going to, to introduce some key folks on the call we're happy to have with us tonight. Uh, from the MBTA, again, my name is Philip Cherry. I'm in the transit priority group here at the MBTA. Uh, we also have Eric Shire from the MBTA's capital delivery team, along with Katie Zazira. Uh, we have a number of folks from the city of Boston, including Matt Moran, uh, William Moose, Hannah Archer, uh, Tyler Liu, and Kwame Kufour, along with several others. And we have members of our consultant team, Ned Codd and Katie Moulton with us. Uh, this slide is an overview of what we'll be talking about tonight, giving you some background, discussing both some challenges and some exciting opportunities, a little bit about the design elements that can inform the concept, next steps and then as reagan talked about uh, we really are excited to get your feedback and so we have small group breakouts as well as a q a session at the end so starting off about the next the project uh, first off this is a 1.2 mile uh, roughly uh, project limit from approximately the jackson square orange line station area to the Ruggles uh, Orange Line Station area. And there's also some, some small pieces of Tremont Street near Roxbury Crossing, as well as Ruggles Street uh, near Ruggles Station. And uh, we'll certainly dive into a lot more, but that's kind of the overview of this project area. A lot of key stakeholders along this corridor that you may be familiar with, including the Roxbury Community College, uh, the Islamic Center, Reggie Lewis Track and Field Center, and a number of other uh, community uh, centers throughout the corridor. I really want to emphasize, and, and you'll certainly hear a lot from, from Matt Moran, my counterpart at the city, that this is a very strong partnership on this project between the city and the MBTA. A little bit of background of sort of where this project originated. Uh, it was part of the Go Boston 2030 planning effort that wrapped up a few years ago. Uh, many of you may have heard about the bus network redesign that the MBTA has been working on. And uh, this corridor is slated to serve several of what are called the high frequency routes. Uh, some recent data about just how important uh, bus service is to the MBTA. Just as of last month, bus trips represented 45% of all MBTA trips. So nearly half um, are extremely important. It's part of the Boston Vision Zero High Crash Network. It does build on the phase one bus lane project, if any of you are uh, familiar with that. And then, like I said, it helps address several city and MBTA goals. A little bit more about the strong partnership and collaboration between the MBTA and the city. Uh, really at a high level, the city, uh, owns the streets and maintains the physical elements of those streets that you can see listed below. And the MBTA operates and maintains bus service and other key bus infrastructure along those streets. And also, as you may be aware, you know, oversees fares and signage, the vehicles themselves and the bus operators. And so it's really important uh, that that the city and the MBTA are coordinating and, and we are definitely doing so on uh, a nearly daily or sometimes twice daily basis on this project. There's also a lot of other projects uh, beyond this one along this corridor and in this area. And uh, we certainly want to emphasize that we are coordinating with those. Uh, this is just a small number of them. There may be other smaller projects, but uh, the MBTA has the bus network redesign that I talked about. There is a significant station improvements project in Jackson Square. Uh, the city has some planning efforts on Terrace Street and Parker Street upcoming, as long as, along with a, uh, a slow streets program in the Highland Park neighborhood. Uh, there's a large development through the BPDA at the northern end of this uh, corridor. 
and then the DCR is uh, is going to be embarking on a project to uh, look at the Southwest Corridor when they within the segment of our project area. This is just a, a brief slide of sort of where this fits within the greater context of some of the work that the MBTA is doing. Uh, you'll see the top line says bus transit priority, and that's really the the heart of you know, what we're looking at here is exploring how to make buses go faster and more reliably. But we also wanted to give additional context about other components of a larger um, sort of bus program that the MBTA is working on. And that includes everything from improved signage to make sure that passengers are more aware of when vehicles and trains are arriving, improving the bus stops, um, and even looking at operating to make sure buses are are departing and arriving on, on regularly scheduled headways. And with that, uh, next slide. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Matt Moran to talk for a few slides about some of the city's involvement in this. Great, thank you very much, Philip, for that um, excellent introduction. As Philip mentioned, my name is Matt Moran. I work for the Boston Transportation Department. And in terms of what we do on the city side, we are the roadway owners, we are the roadway operators, and we partner with the MBTA because the MBTA, as Philip mentioned, runs the services. So by partnering together, we can create a much more effective and efficient transit network for our riders, our residents, and for everyone else who's using the roadway system. This is our Go Boston 2030 mode share goals. Go Boston 2030 is the city's long range transportation plan. And I think it's important to note on the left, our main goal is to reduce the number of people driving alone throughout the city. So what that means is people heading to work, heading to school, or other activities by car. We want to do this by making other transit modes more attractive, and better, more efficient to use. <clears throat> so we get there by increasing public transit use by one third, increasing walking by about half, and then increasing cycling by fourfold. And I think that public transit number is important because we already are starting from a very high base. There are well over 500,000 transit trips per day in the city of Boston. So for context, that number has to go up substantially. Because of the bus network's unique ability to be flexible, be somewhat more agile than the rapid transit network, this is where we see the most ability to grow our transit ridership share. Next slide. So we have a few project goals and Part of what we're hoping to hear from you tonight is, are we capturing these goals correctly? And the first goal is to prioritize transit, support active transportation, and support safety. Second, we are hoping to support residential, educational, institutional, and emergency services access across the Columbus Ave and Tremont Street corridors, because that last part, which I think is important, if a lane is big enough for a bus, it's also big enough for an ambulance. And then we are hoping to center this project in the needs of the people who live, work, and gather here. So it's really looking at the public realm, it's looking at placemaking, it's trying to create an environment that people want to be in um, on Columbus Ave and Tremont Street. Next slide. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. We have a poll that we're hoping to share with you. So Reagan, thank you. So we're gonna give you about a minute to answer this poll. And we will wait until we start to get results in. Matt, do you mind reading the poll out loud oh, for the interviewers? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, so the poll is, uh, what modes do you use while traveling in this area? Please select all that apply. So the first option is automobile, yours or a member of your households. The second, bicycles. The third, MBTA buses. The fourth, MBTA Orange Line. The fifth, private shuttle buses. The sixth, rideshare, so Ubers and Lyfts and so forth. And then this, the last is walking. So please select all of those that apply. And it looks like responses are in. We've been at 43 now and we are just coming up on a minute. I can end the poll if that works. Great, thank you, Reagan. And sharing results. Great. So it looks like we have a 
very high share of people who are using the orange line. So that came in at the highest rate. So 32 of the 43 people who answered, 74% chose orange line. That's then followed by people who uh, use an automobile and people who bike, which are identical, 22 of the 43, so 51%. MBTA bus was not far behind that at 19 of the 43. Walking was also quite high, and I apologize. Walking was actually uh, ahead of buses. I can see it at the bottom, 21 of 43. And then ride share and private shuttle buses were also in the mix as well. Great. Uh, so we can. So next, I'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities. So we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of this corridor, when we look at the existing transit network and the existing transit usage. We have congested and high ridership buses. So you say high ridership, there are about 28,000 weekday bus riders on this corridor. So that accounts for um, more than 50% of the people who are on this road uh, during the peak periods. Now it's important to note that is just MBTA bus riders. This does not account for Boston Public School buses, LMA shuttle buses, or other institutional buses that are traveling on this corridor. So that percentage is probably higher when you look at the total number of people who are on this corridor who are in some sort of bus and would likely benefit from bus lanes. It's also important to note that the half mile trip from Nubian Square to Ruggles Station takes a very long time. So it's about a 10 minute trip between those two points, much of which is to account for the congestion along the stretch of road. So we also know though that with Columbus Ave phase one. So that's the corridor south of Jackson Square that we opened last year. We saved about 48 minutes of travel time for buses. So we know the bus lanes can work and we believe that this corridor is a potential opportunity for additional bus lanes. Next slide. As I mentioned before, and as Philip alluded to, there's also a very high crash history on this corridor. So when we look at crash data, from the beginning of 2019 through the end of September of this year, we notice that there are a number of crashes that have occurred throughout the Columbus Ave corridor. So this is the stretch from Jackson Square at the south, so the left side of your screen, going up to Heath Street, going to Cedar Street, and then uh, as far as Roxbury Community College, or just the southern end of Roxbury Community College. And this is just over a relatively short period. So you know, really since the uh, start of 2019. Next slide. And this is that same stretch, or the, the continued stretch of road from Roxbury Crossing Station, the Tremont Street, Malcolm X Boulevard section on Tremont Street, going all the way up to Ruggle Street and continuing to Melnea Cass. So as you can see, a high crash corridor. And it's important to note, these are just crashes that were reported in, to police and actually had a police report. So the actual number is likely higher. It's just a fault of our data that we don't actually have a, um, a record of all the non-police report crashes. So next slide. And if you look at the corridor, you can start to see why. This corridor was built in the 1960s and 70s, and it was largely built to accommodate vehicular traffic. So it was built as a wide arterial street it was a street that prioritized cars over transit and walking. It encourages high speeds for vehicles. It encourages, um, it creates unsafe conditions for pedestrians and cyclists who are traveling all along the corridor, not just at the intersections. We know that existing curbside regulations um, don't really match what drivers want or need. And we know that despite being right next to the Southwest Corridor, this also lacks a significant amount of public realm and green infrastructure that we would add to a road today. So it's not really a street that would readily uh, accept a, um, you know, sort of adapt to our climate change goals. Next slide. And these are a few examples of the bike and pedestrian experience on Columbus Ave and on Tremont Street. So. The first thing to note is the lack of separate curb uh, ramps for people who are walking and people who are biking. And this creates a annoying conflict and an unsafe conflict at intersections. So 
bikers and pedestrians have to mix together when crossing the streets. These are also ramps that are non-compliant in terms of accessibility. So a person in a wheelchair would have a difficult time using this curb ramp. And we know that this creates just a very unpleasant experience for people who are walking and biking on this corridor. And as a driver, it creates some confusion as well because you don't have a very clear place to, um, uh, to access for uh, vehicles. Next slide. So how do we get here? And I'm gonna turn it over to Reagan once more for another poll. So Reagan, if you could please bring the poll up. All right, so the question is, how often do you travel on the approximately one mile segment of Columbus Avenue and Tremont Street? So this is between Jackson Square and Ruggles, uh, which is the focus for this project. So the potential answers are every day, multiple times per week, a few times a month, or once a month or less. And so we'll give you about a minute uh, or until we start to see that the answers are starting to slide off. All right, so we are at 42. Anyone else want to answer? 43. So we've matched our previous polls numbers. 44, we beat our previous poll in terms of number of people have answered. All right, Reagan, I think we can close the poll. Yeah, it should be all set for you, Matt. I'm oh, sure. sorry, I have to do it. My apologies. Did it, I apologize, did it share? Yes, it should be sharing. Great, okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. So the top answer is once a month or less, uh, followed by multiple times per week, followed by a few times a month, followed by every day. So thank you all very much for sharing your responses. So I am gonna turn it back over to Philip Cherry, who is going to talk a little bit about how we get there, Philip. Thanks so much, Matt, and, and thanks for everybody's participation on those uh, on those polls. Uh, we're we're obviously holding this meeting to to get your feedback. Uh, we've certainly collected data, as you can tell, about how many people use the corridor, the crash history of the corridor, some of the conditions, and your feedback. In addition to that analysis, will really help inform the concept that comes forward, but. You know, when we talk about how we develop a concept, I sort of like to think of, of a menu or, or like a, almost like an artist palette of the different tools that we have. And uh, we're gonna go into each of these listed on the left here in a little bit more uh, detail. And so, you know, this is an array of those. And if we can move to the next slide, we'll just start off with bus priority on the next slide, which is uh, different different ways could be Paint on the ground. Many of you may have seen some of the bus lanes uh, throughout Metro Boston uh, that have been implemented over the last five or six years. Uh, there's also a variety of that called a Q jump lane, which is which is just kind of a shorter bus lane right at the intersection with a signal treatment, which ties in well to the uh, to the transit signal priority component. But you know, another point of data that I like to note here is. Uh, for all the buses routes operating along this corridor, they serve nearly 50,000 riders per day. So uh, we're talking about, you know, Matt mentioned the 28,000 who are traveling along the corridor, but uh, some of those routes, you know, meander and travel uh, quite, a, quite a ways off the corridor. I think it's important to note that these projects benefit the riders who never even travel over this segment of the corridor because their bus is more reliable and more rapid as well. So uh, while we're focused on Tremont and Columbus between Jackson Square and Ruggles, uh, there's really kind of a cascading or a network effect at play here. Next slide. Another key element that we really wanna focus on is the stops themselves. Uh, hopefully you're not waiting for a bus very long, but inevitably you may be waiting for a few minutes and really thinking about the shelters and the seating, uh, making sure that passengers like yourselves have uh, signage and transfer info, that there's a feeling of safety and security with enhanced lighting, 
emergency call boxes and countdown clocks is all something we're, we're focused on and, and that the MBTA has, has implemented recently, both on uh, the Columbus Avenue phase one project, which was implemented. Uh, start date was just about a year ago, but you may have noticed uh, some of these signs throughout the system. For example, there's, there's a digital screen at the uh, Maverick station on the blue line as well. Next slide. And then transfer points. I think I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the bus network redesign and the high frequency bus routes that will be a part of, that will be traveling over this corridor. And so our team is trying to be as cognizant as possible of not only orange line to bus transfers, uh, but also bus to bus transfers, given the number of, of uh, buses traveling along here. So how can we make those as, as first and foremost safe, uh, but then seamless for riders as possible? And the text on the left there you know, covers that in, in detail with, with signage and screens and some of the other elements uh, that, I've, that I've talked about, but that's, that's an important component of that as well. And now I'm going to hand it back to Matt to talk about some of the other elements that we're really focused on. Great. Thank you, Philip. And so obviously we want to make sure that we're accommodating and thinking through the multimodal system, the multimodal network. So we need to think through the bike facilities and bike connectivity. So to that end, we are looking at ensuring safe, and accessible connections across this corridor for people who are biking. So that means having separate bike and pedestrian facilities in the Southwest Corridor, as I alluded to earlier, having wider bicycle crossings that connects the Southwest Corridor bike facility, creating clear wayfinding at plazas, especially at Roxbury Crossing to delineate between people who are riding a bike and people who are walking, sitting, and you know other activities within the plaza. And then increasing blue bike parking and stations in close coordination with our active transportation team. So ensuring that where we might have a gap today in the blue bike network, that we're able to fill it or where there might be a new opportunity created by having a station or a transfer point that we are able to uh, add a blue bike station to enable that first mile, last mile trip from the bus. Next slide. We are looking at pedestrian connections. So, as we all know, a person getting on a bus is first a pedestrian. So we need to think through carefully that pedestrian connection to a bus, but also the pedestrian connection around the neighborhood and around the community. So this includes upgrading curb ramps and crosswalks, having new updated pedestrian signals, thinking through safe bike and pedestrian infrastructure and how that sort of plays together across the corridor and thinking through mid-block uh, crossings to enable good pedestrian connectivity between the Southwest Corridor and the Roxbury neighborhood on one side. And I'd like to note, this road wasn't always like this. This road, as I mentioned before, was a product of the 1960s and 70s. And these neighborhoods used to be much more tied together before the I-95 corridor was planned. And so I think part of this project is really restoring that urban fabric and that connectivity that was lost in the mid 20th century. Next slide. We need to think through green infrastructure and public realm. The city of Boston recently hired a green infrastructure coordinator. So we have the ability now to think more closely and carefully about these elements. So having good plantings and street trees, incorporating elements for natural and storm runoff, uh, incorporating things on the public realm side, like having benches, public art, placemaking elements and street furniture, and thinking about you know, in close coordination with all of you, what these public realm elements should look like. Should we hire local artists? Should we have a sort of competition that focuses on the future of the public space here? What should this look like? And we really wanna get your feedback on that from a public realm, public art and placemaking standpoint. Next slide. And thinking about the last two things, which are very important, so curb access. So thinking about how we deliver goods and what sorts of curbside needs there are from the businesses that might be on the corridor, the institutions that might be on the corridor, 
considering flexible curb space with potentially different hours for different uses. So maybe a curb space is a pickup drop-off zone in the evening and in the morning it reverts to a loading zone. And thinking through what signage, marking, and enforcement needs there are for that. Last, on the maintenance front, we see it as critical that this corridor is properly maintained once it's completed. So thinking through what are things as simple as sh snow shoveling, what's the public realm maintenance plan look like, what does the landscaping plan look like, and thinking through this in terms of close coordination between both the city and MBTA, but also DCR and other key stakeholders in this area. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Philip, who will finish us out with next steps. Philip. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for everybody's patience. We're just about to, uh, to get to receive your feedback. Uh, some of you may be interested in, in sort of what's next. You can tell that over the past few months, we've been engaging some key stakeholders, which include elected officials and some of the larger institutions along the corridor and analyzing a lot of actually what you've seen um, summarized in this presentation. Uh, you're here at the, uh, the first public meeting. There will be an open house in two weeks, which we'll have more information on in the coming slide or two. And then we'll have another public meeting after we have developed a concept for you all to uh, review. And so obviously your feedback tonight is, is a key part of that concept development. Uh, in 2023, once we've nailed down that concept, uh, our team and consultant team will be hard at work really advancing the, the detailed engineering plans along with additional public meetings as some of those fine grained details are ironed out. And then we look to uh, really be in the construction period in earnest in 2024 and, and 2025. Again, I mentioned there is another opportunity for feedback. Uh, that is two weeks from tonight, November 9th an in-person open house, and that is from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Roxbury Community College, uh, the Commons 3 and 4 in the academic building. Uh, there's also an opportunity if you have to drop off tonight's call or would prefer to give your feedback more anonymously, uh, you see the web link there, mbta.com slash Tremont Columbus feedback. Uh, there were no spaces or hyphens in that. And that is an opportunity to give very similar feedback to what uh, we will be breaking out for in just a moment here. Uh, that is available also as interpretation tonight is in English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and simplified Chinese. And this uh, feedback form closes on Friday, November 25th, which I believe is maybe the day after Thanksgiving. So a great Black Friday opportunity for all of you. Next slide. And here's, here's two more links uh, that I believe will be shared in the chat on this uh, for additional project information as we continue to push out more info. Uh, I'll read that link, mbta.com slash Tremont Columbus. And then you may remember earlier, I talked about the broader program of MBTA bus projects and that link for the Better Bus Project is mbta.com slash better bus. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Reagan, I think. Or no, one more slide for me, I think, if we can go on. So we're gonna have some small group breakout sessions and um, Reagan is going to give the nuts and bolts of how that works. Um, but I'm going to go over some of the questions that we're going to ask here. So if you want to go to the next slide. First, we're just going to introduce ourselves if you're comfortable. No worries if not. It should be a group of roughly 10 to 15, maybe 20 people. Um, and then these next four questions listed here. So I'll read those. What are your biggest issues or points of frustration along the corridor? And as examples, there's safety, wayfinding, congestion, noise, et cetera. Second is, what would improve your experience and or safety traveling along the corridor as a bus rider, cyclist, or pedestrian? Uh, Matt mentioned a really key part of this is activating the public realm, green infrastructure, plantings, and art. 
So we're curious, uh, we'd love to hear where specifically along the corridor uh, you feel this type of treatment would be most applicable. And then fifth, uh, we see Roxbury crossing uh, both the Orange Line Station area and, and the plaza as a key community hub and, and really a key node in this design process as part of the, this project and the bus network redesign. So we would love your specific feedback um, on your experiences at that location. And yeah, those are the five questions. Next slide, please. Hand it over to Reagan to, to go through some of the, the nuts and bolts of how we'll be broken out here. Thank you, Philip. So as Philip just discussed, um, we will be placing you in small group discussions to get your feedback and ideas. There are no differences in content between the rooms with the exception of any non-English language breakout rooms. As a reminder, if you prefer a non-English breakout room and did not indicate that preference earlier, please message us now in the chat. So each breakout room will have a group leader who will facilitate the discussion. So you do not have to memorize the questions that Philip just ran through. Um, and the conversation will focus on your feedback. Um, I know here it says that we're gonna go until seven o'clock, but I think Philip, uh, I think we should go to 7.05, um, give people a full 25 minutes for discussion. So, and we will post some warnings in the chat as the countdown gets a little bit closer. Um, and then we're going to reconvene here at 7.05 for some report outs of the breakout rooms and then a general question and answer session and a discussion of final steps. So with that, Kyle, can you move everyone to the breakout rooms, please? Terrific. So thank you all for participating in those discussions. We really appreciate your feedback. Actually, Nate, if you could hold off on the screen share for one moment. Um, we appreciate your feedback and we'll take everything we heard tonight into consideration. I am actually going to call on each group leader to give a short overview of what was discussed in their group tonight. And I'm going to put William Moose from the city on the spot because he's I'm, I see him in my little gallery window. Sure. Thank, thank you, Reagan. Um, so, so we had uh, several people in our group uh, provided some really great feedback. Um, some of the comments that we received, um, several focused on um, lack of, uh, of adequate uh, lighting um, along the corridor, particularly at um, crossings um, and crossing um, Columbus and Tremont um, saying that those, uh, those did not feel like they were adequately lit um, and people saying they don't necessarily feel safe at night um, along the corridor um, and that the lighting plays a part in that. Um, you know, one person said that the space feels more like a pass through space, like a place to get from A to B, um, like there's no reason to, um, to stay there, to linger there, um, no seating um, if you wanted to, to rest for a moment. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we also had some comments from um, from folks who uh, who bike, who walk, who take buses, um, who uh, who highlighted um, long and scary pedestrian crossings, um, especially across Tremont and Columbus. Um, also, that uh, the curb ramps along the Southwest Corridor um, are too narrow um, for the volumes of people who are crossing there, um, and that cyclists and pedestrians. Um, can't, uh, can't all easily navigate um, the, that narrow space. Um, and uh, some other comments also focused on sort of the public space, public realm along the routes, um, saying that the plazas around the stations um, kind of feel um, uninviting, there's dead trees, um, 
a lot of trip hazards in the plazas. So uneven bricks and pavement, um, missing bricks. Um, there was a question about, um, in particular, how we're going to uh, uh, accommodate all the people who want to cross straight out of Roxbury Crossing across the street to the, uh, the very heavily used bus stop across the street, which is going to be even more used um, in bus network redesign. We're going to have more buses more frequently in those, you know, at that transport point. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, the intention to provide a pedestrian crossing there. Um, and then finally, someone just said that in general, the sidewalk that runs along the corridor feels very uncomfortable um, because it's very close to fast moving traffic. Um, and you know, if there were opportunities to widen the crosswalk to add maybe a green buffer um, between traffic um, and uh, the sidewalk, that it would make that more comfortable and also reduce uh, sort of pedestrians and bikes using the same space and having conflicts. There. So, mm -hmm. thank you, William. Um, so I am going to turn it to Philip next. I'm going to put you on spotlight, Philip, and I'm going to take William off. And if you want to, I know there's some folks still waiting to do Q&A, but if you want to share uh, some of the comments from your group, Philip. Sure. We had we had a lot of uh, really active folks and appreciate their engagement. Uh, there was some significant discussion about safety hotspots, namely Cedar Street and Jackson Square. Similar to Williams group, there were concerns about the long crossings. Uh, several folks touched on enforcement issues, which is somewhat beyond the scope of this project, but uh, something the, N the MBTA is actively working on. Um, there were there were several discussions about uh, the P3 development and some of the opportunities that it could afford and, and sort of activate that space. Um, similar to Williams group, kind of a walk and travel through but not stay type of comments i think that there was uh that there was uh frequented by many and then access to the longwood medical area was brought up several times both uh, on shuttles and uh, really by all modes but shuttles bike and pedestrian access um, and, and really highlighting that route was something that that several folks uh mentioned so yeah Thank that's you. a good summary. Excellent. Um, and now I see Matt. And so I'm going to turn to Matt's group and add spotlight for Matt. Great. Thank you, Reagan. So uh, really great discussion from my group. We focused on a few things, and I think it could be boiled down to one overarching theme, which was the challenges posed by safety. And, uh, you know, it was everything that was met, everything that was mentioned were things like getting to the bus. Uh, crossing the street on bike or foot. And one participant noted that sometimes it feels safer to cross illegally at different points in the corridor because the current layout of some of the intersections just doesn't really feel comfortable or safe the way the traffic turns, the way the sight lines work. And we heard that these safety issues were really generated by high speeds. So this roadway was not very well designed for pedestrians and encourages speeding traffic unsafe sight lines, and as mentioned before, poorly designed intersections that one participant called treacherous, which I couldn't agree with more. So we also heard from folks that we should, that encouraged us to think about some next steps. So we heard from a, in a big picture sort of way, better pedestrian facilities. So thinking about how people cross the street more safely, thinking about green infrastructure. So how do we incorporate more greenery, more climate resiliency, more street trees, into this Columbus Ave, Tremont Street corridor. And then of course, thinking about better bike facilities. So what is the future of the Southwest corridor gonna look like? What are we doing to coordinate with DCR to make this a better corridor? What are we doing for nearby initiatives like Malcolm X Boulevard to really connect the Southwest corridor and other existing bike infrastructure into Roxbury and other surrounding neighborhoods. And that sort of led to another point, which was that we should coordinate with other agencies out there, which as Phil alludes to during the presentation, we've begun doing and will continue to do. We also heard the folks like the Columbus Ave phase one project. So really happy to hear that. And uh, just generally folks like that because of the speed and the safety elements that were brought in by that project. But uh, and this is a note for William Moose, they would love to see more bike infrastructure 
in the Eagleson Square area, which fortunately we are working on through a project that William has on his plate right now. So thanks to, to my group. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. And I think Ned is the last group. And as Ned unmutes himself, I will point to William's comment in the chat. Uh, he had a, a, some extra remarks from his group that he shared with everyone. Ned? Uh, thank you. Um, we had a, a good conversation in our breakout room uh, that focused a lot actually on the, uh, the Southwest corridor. Uh, and we heard uh, a lot about um, uh, concerns about safety of the the crossings, uh, desire for um, uh, for um, for for dual crossings, uh, issues with conflicts between pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as between pedestrians, bicyclists, pedestrians and bicyclists with vehicles at the crossings, a desire to have. Um, uh, dual crossings, one for uh, bicycles, one for um, uh, for pedestrians, uh, desire for um, uh, raised crossings, especially at uh, um, uh, unsignalized locations, um, concerns about conflicts along the path uh, between pedestrians and bicyclists, and a note that um, pedestrians are often in the designated uh, bicycle path because the sidewalk is uh, adjacent to high-speed traffic, concerns about lighting uh, along the corridor as well as along the Southwest corridor uh, and um, uh, safety and security issues associated with those. Um, uh, um, concerns about uh, enforcement, uh, speeding along the corridor, as well as uh, double parking toward the, the northern end up by uh, Ruggle Station, um, uh, need for accessibility improvements throughout the corridor um, for the, 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 the crossings and the traffic signals and, and uh, audible pedestrian signals. Um, uh, let's see, um, looking to other, other places in the U.S. around the world for, for best practices, uh, for, for, for safety, for speed reduction, um, conflicts, uh, um, with vehicles at crossings, uh, um, uh, support for, um, for, for, uh, implementation of dedicated bus lanes, um, uh, and even uh, uh, early implementation of those before other um, uh, improvements are, are put in place. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of comments about uh, improving safety and support for uh, walking, biking, riding transit. Thank you, Ned. Um, well, it sounds like all of the discussions were lively and touched on a lot of the different topics that were in the presentation, and I think gave the team some great feedback. Um, Nate, do you mind resharing the slide deck now? Um, so I want to thank you all again and note that we're going to move into the question and answer section. Um, if you I'll note this, I know some people had already shared comments and questions prior to the breakout sessions. I am going to assume that your questions were answered in the breakout sessions. If not, you can post them in the chat again and we will get to them. Um, so can you go to the next slide, Nate? So if you would like to share a comment or ask a question, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and submit to ask a question. Um, I'm going to try to alternate between reading questions and comments that were already submitted and recognizing those who want to pose a question verbally. Um, we're going to try to hear from as many people as possible, so I will ask folks to be brief. Um, for those joining, uh, for people who want to share a comment or question verbally, you can press the raised hand button. And for those joining on the phone, you can raise your hand um, 
by pressing star and the number nine. Um, so that's star nine. Um, for all attendees who do not speak English, um, please raise your hand to provide your comments and questions verbally for the interpreters to hear and they will repeat your comments. Um, when we get to that section, when we recognize your name, we will unmute you and you will be able to speak. Um, and after you share your comment, we will lower your hand and you will be returned to the muted state. So before I open this section of the meeting up widely, I would like to invite any elected officials or staff in attendance to make, to ask questions or make comments. Um, you can use the raised hand feature if there are any electeds uh, here tonight. Okay, I am not seeing any. So um, I will now invite members of the public to give your thoughts if you have not already shared them in uh, the breakout sessions. So I have not seen any chat comments come in um, and I do not see anyone with raised hands. Clearly the discussions were fabulous and wide ranging. Okay, I do see someone with their hand raised. Uh, let me go to them right now. Oh, several people now. Um, I see Allison. So Allison, I'm gonna unmute you. You should be able to speak now, Allison. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up the comment from William Moose that um, the uh, bus stop in front of the mosque is going to be used more um, often in the future because that's a very problematic bus stop. And I, I realize uh, you, this is an MBTA meeting, uh, but our, our themes have, mostly focused on the roadway and, and the corridor, but um, there is a lot to say about bus stops. And the problem with that bus stop, of course, is that so many buses are stopping there and you have to figure out which one is yours and so on. But people are running across the street from the Orange Line station and they're seeing their bus waiting to make the left turn, the bus that's coming from Ruggles. And in the future, maybe that bus is going to stop could have stopped in front of Roxbury Crossing versus coming from Ruggles, I don't know, but it seems a very problematic situation to me to um, have so many passengers waiting on a narrow sidewalk for uh, multiple routes um, and depending on having to cross a whatever it is, seven lane road to get to their stop um, to transfer. So I'm hoping maybe there's going to be a change, but it, it is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I don't know, Matt or Philip, if you want to respond to that. I'm happy to hop in from the MBTA's perspective. Uh, the, the final bus network redesign will be released in the coming weeks. And uh, it's very likely that there will be some route changes in this area. And so I think to William's comments, um, some of some of those routes may be along Malcolm X Boulevard, but to, to this project, we understand the importance of Roxbury Crossing, not only as a community hub, uh, but within the context of bus service, how how many routes pass through there and, and that there needs to be a lot of focus on serving uh, a lot of buses in a given hour and a lot of people waiting to get on those buses. And so I think your your feedback is is absolutely valid and and looking at uh, how do we make sure buses have enough space to to stop and dwell and pick up um, and also what can we do to make that crossing across from the orange line station to uh, wherever you're going at Roxbury crosses whether it's crossing towards the Islam Islamic Center or in, in other directions um, how do you make that safer and maybe even shorter so it's not seven full lanes. Matt, feel free to add anything. Yeah, no, so I would just add and support everything Philip was saying. You know, I think we were looking at this from a multimodal perspective and trying to flip on its head the traditional way that we do roadway and street planning, which is to look at the traffic numbers and traffic volumes and plan based on that. We are really trying to put safety first and we are trying to look at our most vulnerable roadway users first and foremost. So how are people crossing the street? 
how are cyclists getting through this area? How are buses also, you know, getting through this area safely and effectively? And that's not just how they progress up the corridor, but where they make stops, how people get on and off, how they cross safely from a bus stop to the to the sidewalk, and thinking about this holistically. And we know that we need to accommodate vehicles on this corridor. You know, typical drivers, um, you know, heavy. Um, heavy trucks in some instances, or like construction material, like other things like that. But we need to put safety in our most vulnerable roadway users first. So that'll be the lens by which we're looking at this design. Thank you both. Um, I will note that there is a question that came in on the chat from Samantha, who says, I really like the median that was built a few years ago near Jackson Square. Will that change as part of the new design? We'll defer to Matt. So we are very early in the design process. I don't think we want to jump to any conclusions right now. So that's the first thing I'll say. Nothing is predetermined at this point. We want to hear from you first and foremost about what you think is important on the street in terms of placemaking, public realm. But knowing and hearing that, that's good information. And we've also heard from our leadership and from other community groups that that is an important stretch to maintain and even enhance where we can. So find other areas to add green infrastructure like that across the corridor. So our hope is that we will maintain what's there today and then add additional elements like that at other parts of the Tremont Columbus corridor. You got a thumbs up, Matt, in the chat there. Um, so I think Tim Reardon is next. Uh, Tim, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Great, thanks so much. Hi, uh, Tim Reardon. I'm a resident of Jamaica Plain and a board member of the Eggleston Square Main Street, um, uh, which um, serves business owners um, on Columbus Ave and along Washington Street and Eggleston Square. Um, I also travel the corridor regularly and my daughter, who uh, commutes by bus to BLA and loves the new um, dedicated bus lanes. Um, so, you know, sort of very, uh, I think, uh, you know, seeing the very positive impacts of that. And I think some of the concerns that some of the business owners had haven't really come to pass. And so I, I, I think we can count that as a success from, from what I'm seeing in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just want to say, you know, two things, I guess one is, to echo Matt's points, we need to we need to plan for the city we want, not the city we have, and that means planning for a city where taking a bus, riding a bike, or walking is the most comfortable, safest, efficient option that people have, um, and that folks and that leaves the available the remaining sort of travel lanes for people who absolutely must drive, and that everybody else um, can um, can can take another option. We recognize that not everybody can drive. But also there's a lot of people who are driving who can who can take other modes and we want to make it easy and safe for them to do so. And, and I'm really excited that that this group of public agencies is moving that forward. And then just I just want to bring up one issue which I um, you know didn't come up in our um, in our small group, but just thinking about it here, it's just the issue of green infrastructure and addressing urban heat island effects. It's a lot of pavement through there. I think the comment previously about the median treatments in Jackson Square sort of showed one way of moving towards that. And I would love it if, um, you know, we can, um, through this project, we can find ways to do more stormwater infiltration, um, greenery, various things like that that are going to help to uh, to make for more for a cooler and more resilient neighborhood. So no question in particular, just a couple of comments. And thanks for hosting this meeting. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, before I go to the next one, Nate, I'm actually going to ask you to uh, advance the slide just so we have, if I am correct, the project website is on the next slide. Yes. We can leave that on screen during this. Um, I think the next question we have is from Martin. Martin, I'm going to unmute you. You should thank be able you. to. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. I was pleased to hear what was discussed today. So uh, every point that was discussed in the subgroups, I was very happy to hear that with these um, these uh, focal points. I have two questions that weren't discussed that much today, but were alluded to a little bit in the comments. 
So you didn't really uh, talk that much today about details, about uh, prioritized bus lanes. And I have two questions about that. Like one is, um, there's a phase two that has been recently completed with a central hardscape bus lanes. Is there a study out there that people can look at uh, what the impact was on both tr bus traffic and car traffic of these uh, of these phase one changes, which uh, would give a preview like what would work or would not work uh, in a potential phase two. And the second question is um, the concern I have about just extending those uh, hardscape bus lanes towards Ruggles. Um, what the impact is on an already very busy street with lots of car traffic. I just happened to ride by car today along um, the police headquarters, which had a construction site which closed one lane into both directions. And it, uh, it resulted in really uh, congestion and some dangerous situations where people were trying to merge onto different lanes where uh, illegal parking was extended on the outbound lane of Tremont Street, including an existing bus stop. And I would encourage you to have a look, maybe take this opportunity, have a look at uh, what is going on currently at police headquarters and maybe potentially draw some conclusions what, whether that has any preview uh, value for, for making dedicated bus lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Marin. So if I can reframe a little bit, I think there's the two questions Martin has. One is about the data results, what have we learned from Columbus at phase one? And the second is, I think, how the existing conditions traffic um, will be factored into the design and analysis and planning going forward, if that sounds right. Yes, thank you. Great. Philip, Matt, I will let one or both of you jump in. Sure, so maybe I can start and then Philip, please feel free to add in with anything I might miss. So we heard loud and clear on the Columbus Ave phase one process that safety was a major concern of the community. So we heard from folks that speeding was an issue on the Columbus Ave corridor. We also knew that buses were stuck in a significant amount of traffic. It sometimes could vary, you know, by 50% or more in terms of travel time for buses on the Columbus Ave phase one section. In terms of speeding, we had some data from Streetlight, which is a computer program. And folks who are in my breakout session, I apologize, you've heard this before, but this is a way, it's a computer program that sort of scrapes cell phone data anonymously. And we can see things like speeds of vehicles on an average, number of vehicles that are traveling on a specific corridor, along with other attributes. The speed though is I think one thing I wanna highlight. With Columbus Ave phase one, a quarter of the vehicles were going over 40 miles an hour. The city speed limit is 25. So that is a very unsafe condition, especially where you have pedestrians, a public library, a lot of shops, people who are parking cars on the corridor, just a lot of urban activity happening in a very condensed space where you have vehicles going 40 miles an hour through that area. Since the Columbus Ave bus lanes have opened, we have that same streetlight data, and we can see that there are no vehicles going over 35 miles an hour based on the data that we've seen. So a big improvement in terms of typical vehicles are going under 30, and we don't see any vehicles that are traveling over 40 miles an hour on that corridor. We also know the buses are saving a significant amount of travel time on the Columbus Ave Phase 1 project. So Phil had some slides that alluded to those numbers earlier. Um, I won't go through those in too much detail again, but we know that there's been a significant safety and a significant travel time improvement for uh, buses. In terms of what we'll be doing for this project moving forward, we will of course be doing a traffic analysis to determine things like turn lanes and how long they need to be and different locations for adding an extra travel lane in as needed. But again, I think the focus on this is really protecting and accommodating our most vulnerable roadway users first and foremost, and stitching together two parts of the city that were 
I mean, frankly, violently torn apart during the urban renewal and highway construction era of the 60s and into the 70s. And we really want to see um, a much safer, a much calmer, a much more inviting street. And we think that we can do that through, again, planning for our most vulnerable users first and doing traffic analysis where we need to in order to accommodate um, sort of the critical traffic operations. So I can pause there. Philip, do you want to add anything to that? Couldn't have said it better myself. No, I think that's a great, great summary. Excellent. Um, I will note, Matt and Philip, that we are a little past 7.30, but we only have a few questions left. If it's okay, if we stick around and keep going. Excellent. Thumbs up. All right. There's been two questions in the chat. Um, the first um, is from Daniel, who asks um, if, there, if there are any specific peer systems in cities the MBTA is looking to for design and infrastructure inspiration. Happy to happy to take that. Um, good question. Uh, we definitely want to learn from not just other U.S. systems, but other you know North American and, and global systems. And uh, Matt and I were on a call last week or the week before with our friends out in uh, the Salt Lake City region. They have some center running bus lanes, and uh, not exactly in the same type of neighborhood, but they had some really interesting interesting innovative ideas that I think we're going to look at. And then uh, I was on a call last week with some colleagues as well uh, with a transit system just outside of Toronto, Canada, and they have a center running bus lane. And, and the reason we've specifically looked at those two agencies thus far is uh, they have center running bus lanes, which you know we're trying to learn as much as we can um, about those and not a lot of places have them. Um, but the other, the other component is that they are in snowy environments and Matt talked about maintenance. And uh, when it snows a lot, as it can do in Boston, moving that snow, storing it, clearing platforms, uh, that's a critical component of, of this project. So uh, we wanted to, to really reach out to our peers. And I think there's a couple of other agencies, both in the US and abroad that we will continue to reach out to, to make sure that uh, we're learning as much from what we've done here, the MBTA and the city and, and other municipalities have partnered to implement a lot of different transit priority features, kind of our, our menu, if you will. Uh, but we know that there's other designs out there in the world that uh, offer some components that we don't and we want to continue learning. Thank you, Philip. Um, so uh, I will turn to Zach and Maddie DeClerc, uh, who's been patiently waiting. Uh, you should now be able to unmute yourself or maybe not. Wait, I may have accidentally hit the wrong button. Hold, please. There, you should now be able to unmute. Hi, um, I did get to make um, some comments during the breakout. By the way, I have a sick kid, so I had to <laughs> jump off for a sec, but this is an important meeting. So I'm, I'm back. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was um, Back at Roxbury Crossing, there is a um, there's like a, an observation that I've had over the years is there's a like a pedestrian desire path. Um, um, sorry, one sec. I'm just gonna have to catch up to somebody else. I'll try again in a sec. Okay, so um, I actually will say that there is a question in the chat as we wait. Um, Actually, it's asking if there's space that can be created for food trucks or vendor stalls in the design. I imagine it's early days yet, um, but. I mean, early days yet, but we definitely want to think through how we can sort of enhance the public realm, enhance the built environment. Those are fancy urban planning terms for like, what are we doing on the street to make it more inviting for people to linger, to hang out, to enjoy their time there. And so we're looking at a few key areas across these two streets. So the Roxbury Crossing Plaza being one, and we are really looking at ways that we can bring in more life. So having, uh, you know, enhancing the farmer's market and where they are today, doing things to bring in, you know, food trucks and other temporary food stalls. And we'd be open and love to hear your feedback about other parts of this corridor, this very long corridor where that might be appropriate as well. So please let us know, but that was our first 
idea. And Matt is setting me up perfectly to encourage all of you to go to the feedback form that we have the link for, um, especially if you have longer comments you want to make or ideas about where to locate these sorts of uh, public realm uh, type improvements. Um, I see I see two Ralph Waldens with their hands raised in this. So I'm going to I asked I'm going to unmute one. And you should now be able to speak, Ralph. And I don't know, it's maybe that you use someone else's link and you don't, you might be in under a different name. And Ralph, you may want to try, if you have your hand raised, you might want to message someone in the chat or maybe put your comment in the chat. Okay, I'm going to go to the next Ralph that I see with the hand raised and see if that works. You should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, I'm looking at a big screen and using a small iPhone for a microphone. Okay. Thank so you I for got bearing confused with us. about about what button to push. Um, yes. Uh, earlier on, there was a nice, nice uh, support for the center island being a green feature. I'd like to point out another another thing about the uh, center island between Roxbury Crossing and the and the and the end of Roxbury Street is a tremendous desire line and an enormous number of of pedestrians actually cross the street uh, a distance away from any marked crosswalk and they managed to do it without without getting killed and they can do it because they have to only deal with two lanes at a time and they've got the safety of the center island while they plot their timing on the next two lanes so uh this is a, a feature that might get removed if if the uh, if the design looks too much like the Columbus Avenue between uh, between uh, Jackson Square and Eggleston Square. Just caution. No, thank you for your feedback, Ralph. Um, Philip, Matt, I'm assuming your team is doing all lessons learned from Phase One, and we'll be considering these things. Absolutely. No, I think that's great feedback, Ralph. Certainly, you know, these are these are long crossings now and the existing uh, medians that are there, which which may not have been built initially to serve as a median refuge, often serve as that on an unintended basis. I think I think the city and the MBTA's goal is to create a design that uh, more sort of actively and proactively serves uh, you know, improve safety as Matt and I have touched on a couple of times already tonight. So uh, that we we have no idea what what will or won't happen to 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 any of the medians. I think as Matt said, but whatever does happen, if if there is something formal or informal being used for for crossings now, I think we'd want to make sure that that is uh, that that safety feature is is at least maintained, if not significantly improved upon. Thank you, Philip. So I don't think we have any more questions, um, nothing else in the chat. So I will turn it back over to both Philip and Matt to give any closing remarks that they would like to give tonight. Thanks so much, Reagan. And, and really thanks to, uh, to everyone who attended, uh, attended the breakout sessions and, and gave your feedback. Um, you know, in addition to informing you sort of about how we got to this point, I think really this meeting was to get general and really specific feedback on, on how to inform the concept development process. So your, your feedback, your experiences are all extremely valid. We've obviously collected a lot of data and, and started some analysis, but that can never replicate, um, you know, the collective aggregate of your shared experiences and, and how helpful that can be to inform the, the concept process. And, you know, I'll add to what Philip was saying and, and say thank you so much for your time tonight, everyone. 
We know it's not easy to spend your Wednesday nights um, hanging out with us, but we appreciate that you were here. You took the time to give us this feedback and we would love to hear more. So the more we hear from you, the better. Uh, just to plug real quick, we are having another open house meeting on November 9th, which is a Wednesday. As Philip mentioned at the beginning at Roxbury Community College, one additional detail is that we are coordinating with a food truck, which is Jamaica Me Hungry, and they will be at the front door as well. So they'll be serving dinner there. Um, it, it's paid, but either way, um, it'll be fun to have that as a part of our uh, in-person open house experience. So looking forward to hearing more feedback, answering your questions more, and let your neighbors know. There's a lot of information on the websites that are highlighted on the screen now. There's a lot of ways to give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you again. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.